Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Anoki Uncensored, airing for free, as you guys all know, on the number one South Asian radio station in the world, Ruckus Avenue Radio, on the iHeartRadio app. Just download the app and search Ruckus Avenue Radio. Episodes air every Tuesday at 7 p.m. PST and 10 p.m. EST. You can also watch the episodes. You know this already, but I'm reminding you on the Raj Gun YouTube channel and the Anoki Media Facebook page. So hop on over to both and join now or maybe after. <laughs> that would be a good idea. I'm your host, Raj Gun, and I'm coming to you today to share the story of the making of this year's Real World Film Festival's opening night film, Stealing Vows, a film by my dear longtime friend, Bobby Brown, who co-wrote the story after getting inspired following a chance meeting with actor, comedian, author, Ali Hassan, another dear friend of mine, at an Anoki event, no less, who agreed to co-write the script. From this destined meeting, what the film journeyed through with all of its hardships and challenges to finally be chosen, deservedly so, as this year's Real World Film Festival's opening night film is a story I'm dying to share with you all today. So without further ado, please welcome to the show two of my favorite men, the multi-talented Bobby Brown and Ali Hassan. Oh my gosh, my darling men, we are finally here and we are finally doing this. What so an intro. Fun. I don't I, I feel like we should wrap it up now. <laughs> I think we're not gonna we're not gonna step into the shoes, the massive shoes of those incredible intros. Yeah. We oh my gosh. love you. We're good friends. We've done some good work. Let's get out of here. Let's call it a <laughs> There's a story. No, like, so guys, I mean, I, I, I want to actually begin first of all, because, you know, I know you both really, really well. I know your guys' story really well. I'm not sure, I, you know, how many people know how far back we go, but we go back as, as, as long as Anoki has been in existence, which has been mm -hmm. like over 22 years now. So what I want to do is set some context around, you know, a little bit of why you guys came together on this incredible project and who you were before that happened. So can we start there first, guys? And of course, like what a huge congratulations. I genuinely am happy that we've got to this point, considering all the things that I've seen both of you guys do and are still doing. So let me just ask you guys this, Bobby and Ali, I want to begin the conversation by giving everyone watching, listening and reading this as I mentioned, some context around your respective careers before you two met. Let's start with you, Bobby, or should I say DJ Bobby Brown? <laughs> wow, now you're <laughs> really going back. I don't know if your listening audience is that old. Uh, yeah, I, I used to be that guy, DJ Bobby Brown, <laughs> Energy 108, back in the day. Um, that's where the name came from. I was DJ Bobby the Brown Man, and then one day somebody mm -hmm. called me and said, hey, put DJ Bobby Brown on. And it stuck. And that was it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, my goal all along was, since I was a kid, was to be a filmmaker. I'm a, I'm a, uh, the way I say it is I'm a Hollywood kid who grew up in a Bollywood house. Mm. Uh, and Spielberg was my hero. When I was like 14, 12, 14, I saw E.T. for the first time. And that movie just blew my mind. And I was like, this is what I want to do. This is all I want to do. Uh, and of course, as, as we mentioned, DJing got in the way. And it's a lot hmm. of fun. And you're on the radio. And you're in nightclubs. So who the hell needs school? What am I going to go to school for? Um, but that <laughs> ran its course. And, you know, in my, my later 20s, I went back to school for uh, to learn how to become a filmmaker. So I, I went to Humber and became a filmmaker. And then I, I met this powerfully wonderful, beautiful woman in the back of file banquet halls talking to some other uh, camera guy. And she goes, you know what? I got, a, I got a good feeling about you. And this young lady's name was Rod Gern. And I was like, yeah, you know what? We're going to have a long friendship. Um, and that's where I started my career. I, I went to film school in 2000. Uh, I got out of film school in 2002, started my production company by shooting weddings uh and and videography with a, with a horrible company anyways 
Uh, <laughs> you are being so honest. I love this. The, the trauma. You're, uh, you're oh, really the trauma, of, trauma of shooting yeah. weddings. I don't know how why people get into that business, but it explains why we wrote the script we did, which we'll get into <laughs> later. Um, and then, you know, I, I wrote my first TV series called Echo, um, which was, yes. you know, you, uh, this was in 2005, where it was, you know, a magazine show of amazing people doing amazing things, but just happened to be people of color, BIPOC people. Yeah. And I think we, we did a wonderful episode on you, my lovely friend. Yes, my um, dear. And we've been bonding ever since. And then the ups and downs of, of this industry, I did like 14 CBC documentaries, a couple of reality TV shows. I've done probably 150 TV commercials by now, but the number one goal was always making feature films. That's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, and after about 10, 12 years of banging on, you know, the Canadian um, powers that be doors and, and other, other companies, I was ready to quit. I was done. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's this business is about not your talent, not what, what you can do, but who, you know, um, and I was ready to quit um, in 2017. Um, and then I, I remember walking into my, my house late one night and looking at my kids while they're sleeping and going, okay, I can't quit because how am I tell them to continue their dreams if I quit mm -hmm. mine? Mm -hmm. um, and then magically, uh, I think it was two weeks later, I'm at this um, a annual Enoki event, which are legendary in our in our city of toronto if you haven't been to one you you missed out i mean it was like bringing me up uh, they were the best parties ever and sitting I at the you. table with me was this you know rather handsome looking bald man and his wife <laughs> um i and he said oh my name's ali we introduced each other and then he went up and he did us uh, i didn't know he was a comedian he went up and he did a set and i pissed myself laughing um and i went oh my god this guy is really funny uh, and then I approached him and uh, I was like, hey, man, uh, this is what I want to do. I want to uh, I want to write a couple of scripts. Uh, actually, there was one at the time, I think I said, I want to write a movie and I want to I want to bring you in to recruit you to to write this with me. And for whatever reason, and I'll let him tell you, he agreed to do it. And we spent almost nine months in a Starbucks on the Queensway <laughs> and we came up with two feature scripts. Uh, wow. one of which, yeah, one of which is the the low budget version, the Stealing Vows movie. My gosh. And we're going to get into that, guys. So just hold on to that. Ali, let's start with you, where you started in this industry, because you have a bit of a different story. You have a little bit of a different perspective and bring us to the film. And then we will continue on our conversation. Yeah, it all started in a uh, bend called Gujranwala, where my father was born. He was born. <laughs> uh, not just my birth. I'll go to his birth. Um, he, if he was alive, he'd be so upset. He'd be like, Lailpur Oluda Parta. I was not born in Gujranwala. Anyway, he's raising me. Um, my story is, um, is so intertwined with the story we're going to get into in this movie because I... You know, not a great student, but come from a very academic background. My father was an English teacher. My grandfather was a principal. My maternal grandfather was this, uh, the, the, the the father of modern prose poetry in Pakistan, Noon Mim Rashid, right? So this academia, very, very highly prized and education. It's that I come from a family where it's the, you know, the one thing they, they'll never be able to take from you is your education. I didn't really even know who the they was. You know, yeah. this, is, this is immigrants speak for um, this is the way you better yourself and you stand out and this kind of stuff. And I wasn't a strong student. I don't know if it was ADD or, you know, some, some level of ADHD of some kind. I know if I wasn't super interested in something, it was incredibly hard to pay attention mm -hmm. and the irony now is i'm telling my kids like it doesn't matter if you don't like it it's important it's life it's a I'm like oh my god i'm i'm listening to myself and i'm like i can't it's hard to be honest with my own children <laughs> but i have a, a bachelor's and i have a master's degree and i have this it degree and they were all just by the skin of my teeth barely you know getting tutors and other help food was really my first passion it was my singular focus every project in university was about food every single thing so and um 
I remember one of my colleagues in ITI in this IT program also being like, why are you in this program? You know, you should be in the food world. Everywhere I go, people are always telling me you shouldn't be here. And you know, you don't listen to them. You're like, oh, what are these people? And finally, I said to myself, I, I want more than anything to be on the Food Network. I want to have a television show on the Food Network or a, or a food show on any network, really. And I, um, I was working towards that in every single way I could. And part of that, you know, I'd been I'd been emceeing friends' weddings. I've always been a funnier, more gregarious guy. My group of friends, they see friends too cheap to hire a real MC come <laughs> knocking on my door for an MC. Would you MC our wedding? And it was a pleasure for me. I, you know, my friends' cheapness aside, I loved doing that. It's like this beautiful bubble, supportive bubble that you're in, and everyone's laughing and in a great mood. I mean, you can't hope for a better comedy audience. So I start doing um, these these weddings, and I want to be on the, the 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 Food Network. And I said, Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to start doing stand up comedy sets. I'm going to go to these open mics, and I'm going to practice at the open mic as though this audience is a studio audience. I'll make jokes about food. I'll increase my confidence. And as soon as I stepped on the comedy stage, I I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh. This is a place where nobody's telling me you shouldn't be here. This is a place where I feel like I can't wait to do more of this and explore these challenges. So for a while, I was a caterer and I was a, as a, I was a, you know, this was like in my mid thirties, a stand up comic. And I had these two passions. And I remember many of my friends being, being like, oh, you unbelievably lucky prick. You have two passions like I have zero passions and I'm working like three jobs and I'd be like, well, you know, if it's any, I, I wasted a lot of my life up until my mid thirties, if that's any mm -hmm. consolation. Mm -hmm. And um, connecting to this film as well. I remember a friend of all of ours, Roop Magon is yeah. a friend of mine from Montreal and I grew up in Montreal and I finally got a paid gig, a wedding that paid me 500 entire dollars, Wow, 500 whole dollars to do something that I was doing for free. Mm -hmm. And it was great. It was so fun. I got to make fun of all kinds of people coming down. You know, it was a Filipino Pakistani wedding and like great families, great vibes. And Rup Megan said to me, he goes, listen, did you enjoy yourself? And he goes, yeah. I said, yeah. He said, you did well. I said, I did do well. He said, okay, now here's what you do. Don't do any other weddings for at least a year. And I was like, I don't, are we not understanding each other? I did well. It was amazing. He goes, Al, the last thing you want to do is become a wedding MC. Mm -hmm. He goes, believe me, Josh, the band that Roop and our buddy Q is, and in Q we'll get back to in a moment as well. Bobby has mm -hmm. plenty to say about Q. Mm -hmm. We were this close to being a wedding band. And once you become a wedding band, you are stuck in the wedding band circuit. He mm -hmm. goes, you do not want to be an MC. You'll be stuck in that circuit, and that's not why you got into comedy. So he saved me from that, but I remembered that for this movie. I mean, that was, you know, that, as Bobby was drawing upon his past trauma and past experiences and past mistakes, I, I had plenty, I had a few wells to go to myself. We were doing wedding catering. I was doing wedding emceeing and stand-up comedy, and I'd been in many jobs that I was not good at, that I was trapped in, and I was in almost in stuff I was trapped in. So all of that has led to a place now where I do comedy for a living and there's offshoots from comedy, different things and CBC uh, broadcasting. I have a, a comedy show that I host on CBC radio here in Canada. And then I, um, I do uh, some writing here and there and I do a fair amount of acting. I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. And that's all come from stand-up comedy and stand-up comedy came from food. I thought my life was going to be in food. Uh, and Bobby, you know, Bobby, I don't know if I've told you this. I, I'm sure I have. I was so focused on my comedy set that I didn't remember meeting anybody at our table. My wife was like, you're going to leave me at this table? I'm like, e you're 100% getting left at this table. I'm sorry, honey. So my wife actually knew Bobby more than I did before I did. And when he reached out to me, he reached out pitching like, you want to come on board and, and write this movie with me? And I know you're funny. And he mentioned a few times about you're funny, you're funny. And I was like, how do you know that I'm funny, by the way? Where have you seen me? He's like, dude, I watched you do a comedy set at that Anoki show. We were sitting at the same table, but I barely sat at the table. I might have sat for a minute, 
but it was like not real introductions because my head was on like who's this audience what joke should i tell what joke should i not tell Mm -hmm. and um and then after my set i just stayed backstage there was a lot of fun action at the Anoki shows backstage too. all these artists, creative people back there. So I never went back to my wife. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I did eventually, but not that night. Not, not that night. We took care of her, don't we? we took care. Yeah, no, you did. She, she felt very, very comfortable. Um, so let me ask you this. Yeah. Can I ask you this? Um, here you both are. Bobby has this opportunity, something that's very important to him. He's kind of at this point in his life where he's done a lot, but he needs to... F- you know, fulfill his personal passion, right? From all the skill sets, from all the experiences, from everything that he that that he has learned is hard to do in this industry if you don't know the right people. And also if you are South Asian, that that really was a thing, still is a thing, not as much as it used to be, but still is a thing. Um, and here you are, Ali, you're like very, very clear on where you needed to be because You've just told your story. You knew what your passions were. You knew what you wanted to do. Why this project for you, Ali, when Bobby came to you? What was it about this project? Because, you know, we don't take these kinds of projects, you know, that are film projects without really, really thinking about it because they always take years to to, to get through the process. I, I want you to share that. The way you ask that question is so profound as you, you know, push your fingertips together and I and I know you want more than what I'm about to give you but but here's the real answer I am so dumb in certain ways like I didn't know how much work this would be he said you want me to you want to help me write this feature film sure why not uh, not realizing what kind of effort that would be but in my mind also I was really very much in a phase of my life where I was like just say yes to everything Because I, as a creative person, it's like nothing is wasted. Either best case scenario, it becomes a feature film. Less best case case scenario, you get some writing experience on a feature film. Less best case, you don't like this guy and you can write a comedy set about him. (laughs) And you can can tell the world about what it was like to work with this horrific human being. (laughs) Uh, Or you can put it in a book or you have it in the back of your mind. And when somebody else is working on a stage solo show or some piece of work, you say, I have a story I'll share with you. Take it. I've never used this story. Right. So I've always come from that perspective. Like nothing's really wasted. Now, Mm -hmm. again, you know, there's you balance that against sort of your time and your effort. And so sometimes people are like, they're, they're interested in your time, but you're not being compensated in some way. And that's where that kind of breaks. But in this case, the compensation was just the experience. And I really didn't have enough knowledge because I had written on show, I'd written on kid shows, which are 11 minutes long. Uh, I had done punch up writing for a sitcom. So 27 minutes. So somebody gives me a script that's already done. And then I put in, inject the humor in there. But mm. to start from scratch on a film, this was the first time. And uh, I guess uh, ignorance really helped me out. You know, I'd hate to think. I hate to say this out loud, but part of me is like, if I'd known what would have been involved, I might have made an excuse and said, I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. But I said yes. And as soon as we got rolling, the process was so enjoyable that I was like, oh, I'm going to make time for this. You know, and it's it's a tough one with I have four children. Right. And my wife's like, again, you're going to go right with Bobby. You're, for how long? I'm like, who knows? Three hours, five hours. I don't know. We don't have a schedule. And she's like, okay. And so you just have this faith and the payoff. And, you know, of course, we were young. We were naive. We didn't know about a little thing called COVID at the time. Like, we yeah. were like, oh, the world is our oyster, you know. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I just, I felt the same thing you did, Raj, not to not to blow too much smoke uh, in, in, in Bobby's face or up his butt or whatever the right saying is here. But <laughs> Probably a bit of like both. A little bit of both. You meet him, and he is an enthusiastic guy. And he's got ambitions and he's very positive. So, Bobby, I want to ask you this question. The project was wrought with challenges. Can you share some of them? Because it's almost like the universe didn't want you to succeed, but perhaps it did want you to succeed because they also wanted you to earn, you know, to get to this point that we've gotten to. Take us through 
what happened when you were making ceiling vows and and try and touch upon the challenges and how you overcame them if you did because i want people to understand what you went through here yeah this was the hardest thing i've ever done in my life this was um yeah you're so uh, poignant um the universe wanted me to learn everything i need to learn that i haven't done in the last 10 12 years in one film mm -hmm. it was like we're going to teach you every lesson you possibly need now so the rest will feel like butter uh there were times i wanted to jump off a bridge making this film um when you start out making a film like this 100 percent independent like we wrote two one was going to be our mainstream fun comedy film and then me and ali just talked about it we wrote another one that we could do on our own low budget raise some money and do it on our own so we wrote stealing vows and um, we used to, I used some money to shoot a little scene, uh, a debate scene. And they all came. We actually had somebody else playing Rav in the movie at the time um, before Anand and Rajaran came around. But we used that little scene to start a crowdfund. So you need money. I estimated the cheapest we could possibly do this film with the TIP project. TIP is an actor, a side project that allows you to... Uh, the actress to agree to come aboard for a fraction of the fee, but they take a piece of the ownership at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so within the tip project and everything that we needed to achieve gear post everything, I estimated if we can get 250 K bare minimum, we can make this happen. So we set out, uh, we shot a scene. Uh, I used my own money to shoot that scene. Uh, we used that to start the crowd fund. Um, and we thought, hey, you know, we know lots of people are going to help us. And we ended up raising eleven thousand dollars. Wow. And I was completely devastated. I was mm -hmm. like, because we were gung ho. All of us were online. All right, we're launching. Let's go. And we're like, what the hell? This is the where the uh, enthusiasm of Bobby gets you too. Bobby. I, I remember this. You kept saying we only need two hundred fifty thousand. we only need a quarter of a mil that's, <laughs> that's all it. we need it's and not I'm, a in my head, I'm like that feels like a lot of money no it's, it's all we need but i'm like i don't know anything about movie making maybe it is an only yes. and when the 11 came in i was like a bit shy a bit shy of our goal. <laughs> but yes what happened was two of my uh cousins uh, and a brother-in-law in the states saw the the post saw everything we were doing and they're like, hey, uh, I'm going to give you a call on the side. I don't really want to go through the, the site. And they ended up putting uh, almost 60 grand in on the side. So that is how we started the snowball on this on this film. So now we're at 60, 70 ish with with our crowdfund. So technically that was part of the crowdfund. They just didn't want to go through that channel. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, great. So we took that 60, 70,000 and that summer, this is the summer of 2019, we shot one big dance scene of the movie. I was like, okay, let's go shoot one scene and then use that to raise more money. And then I wanted to build in trump cards, right? Because, you know, I'm not known. Uh, Ali was just starting to bloom. Uh, Fuad Omed is starting to bloom. Gia Sandu is starting to bloom. But we're not known entities yet. Anand was. But we weren't known entities yet. So I'm like, how do we build in trump cards to bring people to this film? So I found the hottest dancer I could find on YouTube. Her name was Manpreet Tour. Um, she had like 1.4 million followers. And I was like, hey, and um, I'm doing a small film. I need a little dance number in, in this film. Uh, it's, it's just a dance scene around a wedding. All our stuff happens around the wedding. But I want somebody to perform in the middle of, uh, of the scene. And we want somebody like you. She asked for like $15,000. I said, I have five. And she said, okay, I'll come. Um, maybe oh, that's fantastic. she hasn't worked on her as well. Uh, but she said, okay, I'll do it. Uh, she came and she blew the doors off the track. The song, we'll talk about the song later that me and Q built the album. Uh, she fell in love with the song as well as, I guess, my personality. And she said, I'll do it. She came. And that August, and then we had to fill that arena. So what we did was, okay, how do we do this on this budget? So uh, a friend of mine, uh, where I met you, Pyle Banquet Hall, Ra, a guy named Raj owned that place. And this is, this is you know, he, he goes, during the week, I have nobody here. If you want it, it's yours. So we got the venue for free. Now, how do we get an audience for free? 
we can't put 300 people in there, like 300 times $200 uh, per head for a background. Now you're already gone. Your budget's gone because we got to put five, five uh, wedding scenes in this film. So I called all my friends and family uh, and, and I came up with this plan that we're going to throw a wedding. You are invited to be part of our wedding for $25. You get open bar, a dinner and a show. Uh, and we that is so a, innovative. Yeah, we filled the entire arena with 300 of our friends and family, and they were the audience, and they came dressed like they were at a wedding. Uh, and the night before they came, so uh, we shot on the Monday, we shot all our dialogue and insert scenes and everything else. Same decor, same everything. And then the day they came, we shot it like a videography movie. You just capture mm -hmm. it as it happens. And now you cut that together, and now you have a seamless scene. So that was the plan. That's what we did. Isn't he a genius, um, Ali? It's just like, that's yeah. what I love about him. This is why he was the only person I could ever get to, um, you know, do like the proper storytelling of our annual award shows. J just because there were so many celebrities and so many performances and so much going on and sponsorship stuff need to happen. And I just, I needed to capture everything. And he just knows how to do it. Like just, yeah. and, and, and you don't get to take one, two, and three. It's like one, take, take one. This is the genius of Bobby Brown. Sorry, I just, I had to say that. Carry on, sweetheart. Bless you, my friend. Yeah, you're so biased. I love you. Um, <laughs> I'm not actually. So, I'm yes, not we, actually. And the good thing was that at that event, um, a couple of family members decided, you know what? We're going to help you raise the rest of this money. And then that event got us to the 250. Um I mean, it took a while, right? I had to cut it, put it all together. And then by October, they said, yes, we're, we're going to help you, uh, friends and family. And we, we were at our 250 budget. And our plan was, okay, what's the next event? Ah, my wife's 40th birthday is coming up. She's a New Year's baby. I can use You New didn't Year's. abuse her, did you? You didn't I did. abuse her. I did. Oh I took over her God. wedding. And she's the twin, so I took her sister's 40th as well. So... <laughs> We did, on New Year's Eve of 2020, we did a fake party. Uh, I know, well, it was a surprise party for my wife and her twin. They knew, obviously, they knew. I called all the families to come and do it. And I'm like, this is what we're doing. And early, we're going to shoot a scene. And then we're going to pretend. And then we're going to go, surprise, it's your birthday, actually. But <laughs> that didn't happen till like 1140 because shooting ran long. And everybody got tired of us waiting, waiting for us to say uh, happy birthday. So they all kind of secretly went and said happy birthday to her. I don't yes. think she's 100% forgiven me yet. I don't blame her. <laughs> but I still owe her a trip to Hawaii for that one. So Yes, you her, do. Her 50th. Her 50th will be a good one. There we go. There we go. Yeah, so that's, that's how we got the second scene of the movie done. We had a crowd. We had a venue that we booked. We had food and, and alcohol and everything. And again, we shot our scenes the day before. And then the day they come, you capture it like a videographer. So, so you get the action with your actors walking through the scenes with these 200, you know, 200, 300 people. Um, and that's how we got scene two. And then it was planning time. Okay, now let's, let's break down every scene. We did a full production schedule. Oh, at this point, uh, a friend of mine uh, named Jeremy Hood, uh, who was our line producer on the, this is all serendipity. He was our line producer on Echo. Turns out he is now the head producer at Shaftesbury, which does uh, help Murdoch me out. Murdoch Mysteries. Know. Murdoch Mysteries. Murdoch Mysteries. Yeah. So he's the head producer at Shaftesbury and the head producer of Murdoch Mysteries. I called him in October of 19. As, uh, actually, I didn't call him. Ricardo Diaz, my DP, told him what we were doing. And he called me and he was furious. He said, How, can I swear on this? Of course you Probably can. Not. It's called Enochian censored. Okay. Cool. Uh, <laughs> how the fuck did you not call me? This is your film. I go, dude, you, you're huge. Like you're, you're doing, oh, you're going to come do my little thing. Bobby goes, Bobby, it's your film. Mm -hmm. I'm in. And that's all he said to me. And he hung up. Um, so he helped me plan this together. Now this is what he does. He's a line producer. This is, or, or you know, uh, now he's a big executive, but. This is what he did. When you have a, and, and I don't know why he's not a superstar in this country. He is the best producer I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. When he is on set, things run so smooth, so beautifully. His energy is just 
Fantastic. You, you'll meet him on, uh, on, on the opening at Real World. Can't wait. He is magic. He got us a hundred thousand dollars worth of camera gear, lighting gear, and grip gear for free. Oh my gosh. That's right. There's no way you can do this movie that we did when you watch it on 250K. He called in every favor he's ever uh, you, uh, need, uh, had or acquired, and he put it into us. Um, and the deal was we were going to shoot two weeks in January of all the indoor scenes. And then the gear would go back. And then in May, we would shoot the final two weeks. And the gear would come back to us, and we'd get two weeks of outdoor gear and, and get all the outdoor scenes done. Because this is a summer movie. It's about weddings. It has to be about mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. So we shoot the two weeks in in january pretty flawless um like we we begged and borrowed everything um asma you know asma mahmoud we used of her house she donated her house we three rooms in her house are three sets in our film we tore that poor lady's house apart <laughs> uh i think that there's still scratches on her ceilings from our gear uh and she refused to let take a penny and she refused to to let us repair anything she said no this is i'm i i love you i love the arts and this is what we do Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of people we surrounded ourselves with. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Ali on set when Anand and, and Fouad and Gabe, and you will see the performances on, on this, in this film. They're fantastic. They are fantastic. And when you have low budget, I, I purposely focused on performance that yeah. I did visual impact. Like mm -hmm. I didn't want to spend so much time and money on uh, you know, directing a shot and making something feel, ooh, I'd rather focus on the performances because I don't have the money to make the wow factor. So well, let's the cast, the cast was um, purposely um, brought together. And I, I do want you to touch base on that because I, I think that you're, you're right. The, the big thing, and I saw the very first version of this, and there's been various, you know, iterations of it since then. So I'm excited about seeing the one that I'm going to be seeing. Um, but the cast really brought this film together and alive outside of the cinematography, the storytelling and the plot, mm -hmm. which was actually pretty fantastic. I'd love for you to kind of touch base a little bit on how you brought everyone together. Ali was definitely one of the, um, ca the cast members there as well. He's fantastic. I love this guy. I think he's brilliant at everything he does. And I very rarely, um, you know, people know this about me. I very rarely would ever have someone MC an entire Anoki Awards show unless, unless they're that good. And mm -hmm. this, my man, did the 2017 one, if you remember that, Ali. People yeah. still talk yeah, about, yeah. about you in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been giving me opportunities. I remember I did a small comedy set. You said I have four minutes or five minutes for you. 2014. 2014. That was 2014. And that was Lily Singh was going to be presented with an award. She goes, she she says to me, Bobby, that can you present Lily Singh with an award? And I said, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I was and there. then I think you reflected on it, Raj, and said, how about you do four or five minutes of comedy before you give the award? You know, and you're just sort of giving me these things. And this is where it's the same thing with the film, right? People who support you in these ways they don't even know what it means for your future for their future but these little things go so far uh for and certainly for me they have you know sometimes they backfire as well uh, luckily, <laughs> of course <laughs> of course <laughs> but um, i was there i remember so lily singh cool. saying when when you gave the award she went you're really funny yeah she mm -hmm. goes this guy's jokes that's yeah. what she yeah. said she said it in a, in a way young people speak this yeah. guy's jokes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But um, the cast came together through, we started with Father Med, uh, mm -hmm. who was Gabe Gray at the time. Yeah. Uh, and I, I approached him at one of your events. Mm -hmm. And it's probably 14, uh, 17, around the 17, probably 17, 18 mark. And I said, hey, man, I got I got this script idea I've written with Ali. We, we really want to do this film. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, cool. Because people get pitched all the time. Yes, and I said, no, we're, we're really going to do it. And and then we got together for some pizza and beer one night, and and we we all hit it Wad off. Wad Ahmed does not drink beer. Just let the record right. show. Uh, yeah, that that's true. <laughs> he doesn't. He, he, he barely eats pizza. Right? The we had many beers, me and Ali. Takes, yeah, exactly. we drank for him. <laughs> and then he, it, you know, I wanted a very strong female lead because the the brains of the story is the female lead. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted her to be strong, independent, a little bougie. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes, oh, I got the girl for you. And he brought Gia Sandu aboard, um, who now is yes. a superstar. Like, yes. Uh, and Gia is one of my favorite uh, people to see on camera. Whenever I see her on screen, I, I'm glued. She's just that type of person. She is so dynamic on camera. She's very shy in real life, actually. But mm -hmm. on camera, she explodes. And then she brought aboard, like, we needed to replace our Rav. Because uh, the actor, and, and this is real life stuff, the actor that we had playing Rav before, which is the decorator, for you know reasons in his life, had to take a real job and, and not do a small budget film. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, we respected it immensely. And she goes, I, you know, what do I call my friend Anand? And I'm like, Anand Rajram? I've known Anand for years. I followed him in theater. I'm a huge fan. My kids watched him on Foursquare. Like, I was like, why is he going to want to do my small film? I go, yeah, go ahead and ask him. Um, and then Gia said, yeah, he's interested. Call him. So I called him and we talked. And at the end of the conversation, he said to me, I was actually disappointed you never called me first. Mm. And I didn't know that, right? You don't know what you're building until you start to build it and people see it. Yes. And and the going back to why I did all this, I just wanted to, I hit the F it button. I said, I'm doing this regardless. And there's something magical about the F it button when you hit it. Every door opens and the universe goes, okay, you're ready. I'm going to throw a ton of shit in your way which you talked about earlier, and we'll talk about that later. But you're ready, mm -hmm. right? This is your path now. Go. We will open the doors for you to let this happen, but we're going to teach you a lot of lessons on this road. And then Ali was the perfect chef. Like, we wrote this. It's just him in the movie. And I remember him saying, watching the first cut, going, man, I'm the weak link. And I went, no, dude. You are not the weak link in this movie. You freaking rock in this movie. He is so charming. And the, and, and so it almost turns into a buddy movie with him and Anand. Mm. Uh, and, and I just absolutely loved his performance in this film. He's so good. Thanks. I You know, the weak link comes because I don't have the training in acting. I don't have, like, these are, they've gone to like the Canadian, um, you know, the, the I think Gia went to the conservatory in Montreal, right? The um, I, I'm blanking on the name of it, but anyway, it's it's a top theater uh, training program in Montreal. Uh, CFC Canadian Film Center, that's where Fouad went. Anand, obviously, I mean, uh, you know, um, trained and retrained and overtrained and trains others, and I don't have that. You know, my thing is just comedy on stage, so I'm like, oh, I'm just sort of being. I'm shoehorning myself into this, but um, everybody has been really gracious and kind with their compliments. And, you know, sometimes friends will be like, whoa, you better bring it because of who you're surrounded with. And then, and then, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been very, very like my, my heart swells at, at the, the compliments I've gotten. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that's happened. And, and it's no, it's in no small part, uh, courtesy of Bobby's direction. Also, he's a, mm -hmm. yeah, he's, he's a director fantastic. who knows how, what he wants to see and yeah. he will gently, you know, sparing the sensitive feelings of actors. He will gently nudge you in that direction. Right. And right. get you to see his vision. And it's good. Good. It's a fun, you know, it's, it's a fun process seeing like what you thought would work on camera and then you take three bits of advice from Bobby and you're like, oh, I didn't even know I had that in me. That was pretty good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, this is this is the stuff. This is the stuff that's important that people don't get to hear about. And, you know, and a, a part of this is, you know, the people that need to come out to the film festivals to come and watch this film. I mean, I know that people are very excited listening to kind of the backstory, listening to the behind the scenes, some of the challenges. We haven't even talked about the fact that, you know, when we all shut down, how that affected the film, which I'd love for you to touch base on a little bit, Bobby. I want to be mindful of time. I could talk to you guys forever, mm -hmm. but you know, I only have a certain amount of time in the show and I want to make sure that we get all the information out so we can get people out to support the film. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about some of the places where they can go catch this film, some dates, some locations? I want to let you guys know that, you know, 
Real World Film Festival, which is a huge deal across North America. It's the longest running film festival for diversity film showcasing. And these guys have got on Stealing Vows as the opening film this year. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm so, so proud of you guys that you've accomplished that. But it's not the only place that people can um, go and see the film. Share some of that. Let's get some people in those seats to support the film. I like that idea. <laughs> uh, well, we, we started off in Montreal back in, was it May, Ali? We did yeah. Montreal? Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Then we went to Chicago in uh, August. September, September. Oh, was it September? Yes, you're yeah. right, September. And uh, now we're opening Real World, which is on October 21st. Then we go to, I believe, I, it's not 100% set in stone, but Yellowknife is moving our 9th to the 7th, or 6th or 7th. So we get to Yellowknife. 6th or 7th. I'm oh, sorry, of November. And okay. Ottawa will be November 9th. We have the closing movie in Ottawa. Uh, and then we go to Vancouver for VAF, uh, yeah. the Vancouver Asian Film Festival. That is November 16th, and we are the closing movie at VAF as well. Wow. Um, and we should say, you know, uh, this movie, the, the next things we're waiting to hear about is uh, international dates. Yeah. Because we also have interest from festivals in uh, South America and in Italy, and I don't even know what else. Uh, Bobby's been working on, yeah, and of course, London, yeah. So um, it, when we were in Montreal, hearing people in that theater laugh at the scenes that we wrote, laughing where they should laugh, Q&A afterwards, asking questions that we hoped they would ask or asking questions that we didn't even think that they would be interested in asking. It's just, it's a real, like a huge boost to the to 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 your ego and and just to your your, your sense of self and your your sense of what you're capable of you know mm -hmm, absolutely and another thing i want to mention is and and i don't know how you did all of this as a first film but you also have incredible music that has been created for this film and this is not just borrowing someone's soundtrack this is creating the soundtrack can we talk a little bit about this because our our dear friend Q from Josh the Band was a big part of this. Can we talk about how that came about and when is this soundtrack coming out? What should people expect? Uh, you should expect some bangers. The soundtrack <laughs> is bloody brilliant. It is so Oh my good. gosh. So this, this goes back to my DJ days, right? I used to remix for all kinds of artists back in the 90s. Um, and I put out about a half a dozen house tracks, uh, hip hop and house was my world back then, and and that's what I went to school for. So in early nineties, I went to school for audio engineering. I wanted to become a, a producer, produce records. So I did, um, and that just goes hand in hand with DJing. And I would know, you know, you go to these record stores downtown. From a drop of a needle, it, within three seconds, I knew if it was a hit or not. So mm -hmm. my instincts was always really good when it came to what captures people. So I, we started out on this project. I have all these wedding scenes. Every wedding scene needs a track, right? All the, the romance scenes, they all need a track. Um, the theme of the movie. We wanted a theme song for the movie. Uh, that needs a track. So I sat in my, this computer right here I'm looking at uh, with GarageBand and just did what, do what I always do, just slap beats together to pass the time, put some stuff together. I am in no way a musician none i'm a dj i know how to make a beat i know how to put a package together i know what sounds good i know how things should flow and move but i cannot play anything and then ali goes hey you should meet my friend q uh the bachola you know, Cupid. Bachola. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly and i went and met q sat in the studio with him and he is the sweetheart of sweetheart human beings uh, I don't think I've ever met a more patient, kind human being ever in my life. I don't know why he likes Ali, but uh, he loves Ali to death. <laughs> uh, they are best his friends. Patience, and his patience love comes Ali. in handy there too. Yeah, I love I mean, Ali. I think he's fantastic. <laughs> so I, I played Q all all my beats and sounds. I go, look, I need to turn these into songs. He goes, okay, well, I'm going on tour with Joe. I'll have to listen to him and I'll come back. And, and he, I go, look, I only have max 10 grand to do the entire soundtrack. 
So he comes back from Pakistan. He goes, hey, I want to meet with you. So we sit down and meet. He goes, I don't want 10 grand. I want to do a record album with you. Wow. I want to open a record company with you. Wow. This, this shit is going to rock. So uh, when is this um, soundtrack coming out if it's not already out? Can we talk about that? Can we send people somewhere? <laughs> Bobby. Early 2025. This film is a Bobby Brown film, guys. You have no idea how proud I am to see your film and your name right there, sweetheart. Like we've been talking about this for over two decades and here you are, you finally got on here after paying tons of dues on so many shows, on so many other people's work and making them shine. I want to ask you this, um, what looking back would you say has been the greatest value of this experience that you'd like to take into your next project? Um, oh man, there's so many lessons. Mm. Uh, the value gain, the, the number one value gain in this is I have a new family, right? All these guys are now my family. Like I can, I, I swim in Ali's pool, you know, we all go to each other's weddings and, uh, like we've become family. You cannot, uh, get to this level unless you go through the mud together. And the fact that they wanted to go through the mud with me on this, that, nothing means more to me than that uh and the fact that when we started this and the word got out about this every other south asian actor that is anybody in this country was like i want a bit part get me in this you know i want to do something and mm. that that to me is is a gift and a lesson that that i will take forever like you do something good you do something quality and you do it honestly with heart and people will follow you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's one thing I learned in this, because I always thought good guys finish last. Um, and it's 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 changed in my mind greatly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What to finish off and to close off. What is it when you look back over this experience with this film? And this is a question for both of you. Are you taking into the future? What is that learning for you? I'll let you go first. I think it goes back to this idea of be open to all kinds of new experiences. Had I been the type of guy who said, I don't know anything about writing a film. I'm not going to do that. The idea that I would not have a friendship with this man, that that album wouldn't have been made. This movie would not have been made. These friendships that we have with this crew, I was golfing with one of the people from this movie you know, a few weeks ago. Like this whole, you know, it's like these little extra connectors. One thing happens and then it, different parts of your life, you know, turn into more. I mean, my life is so much richer because of this experience. And it is because I said yes, and I was open to something. And I think there's huge, huge value in that. Mm -hmm. How about you, Bobby? Close us off, darling. Oh, man. Um, make it good. Make it better than mine. Make it okay, better than throw, mine. Throw the question again. Throw the question again. Leave me in. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at the experience of making this film, mm -hmm. what has been the, the biggest value that you're going to take into the future? Um, the, the connection with humans and other people is above and beyond anything else. Uh, my connection to you from day one has been one of the greatest friendships of my life. Um, Ditto here, babe. I met this guy who, who became an instant friend, uh, who introduced me to his best friend. And we actually walked in together, me and Q, to your party in your condo, where Ali almost teared up because he goes, I love this. My two boys walk in together. I love this. That is the human connection I'm love mm -hmm. and that i want to portray in every project i do going forward oh my god that is a perfect way to end this mm. guys thank you so much for coming on and sharing this you know i i wasn't sure what direction i wanted to go in in this conversation you know what was this going to be a who what when why how of the film um and it, and it just ended up being so much more than that i i feel that this is probably one of my 
finest experiences of speaking to people making a film because we really got to the guts of what it means to 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 really feel and breathe and and go through the process of making you know this beautiful creative product that has taken so long and has taken so many hits and here you are and I'm so excited that you guys are actually on the other end and you're not just a film at places like real world you're the opening film you're the closing film at the Ottawa Film Festival you're winning awards you have a sound track with 14 tracks this is insane you know what has come out of this and Bobby I have to attest this and I know that Ali will agree with me to your ability to be just a fully receptive, open person and allowing all the people to bring their genius to the table. Because when you do that, and here you are the general with kind of the focus, drive, and and, and know that at the end of the day, the whatever the problem is, it comes down to you figuring that out. And you've had some innovative ways that you've done that. We've heard that over this last hour. I'm so proud. I'm so proud of what you've accomplished. And I'm gushing at um, this conversation that I've had with both of you. You guys know I've interviewed some of the most biggest personalities in the world over the last two decades. But I have to say this. I'm going to go on record for saying this. This has got to be one of my favorite conversations of all of them. Thank you so much for coming on and just really being real about what this has all been about. And I hope it encourages people to really come out and support this film and support independent filmmaking and support South Asian filmmaking and artists because we need your money in order for the talent to be able to do their genius. We need that. Yeah. Right? Thank you so much, my darlings. I adore Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thank Appreciate you for you, being Raj. such a, an instrumental part of both our lives throughout mm -hmm. the uh, throughout the decades. I love you both. And guys, I just please, please, please go out and support this film. Do you guys have anything out on social media before we um, close off? I just want to throw them to somewhere outside of this. Yeah. I mean, I have a website, standupali.com, where people can see where I'm performing and a variety of things that I that I do throughout the year. And uh, yeah, uh, subscribe to a newsletter that'll you know give you monthly sort of updates on what projects I'm part of. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll even post news about what Bobby Brown is doing with, <laughs> with his life. I would put that on my website, Bobby. That's how much I support yeah, you. I appreciate you because I suck at social media. I <laughs> suck at social media. I think my website hasn't been updated in three years. So. Oh, my God. Don't say that out loud. <laughs> but um, how can people get hold of you, sweetheart? Because I know that, you know, when as this film is getting out there, as people are listening to kind of the story behind this, you know, when they come here at Anoki, anywhere else that you talk about this, they're going to want to be able to get hold of you. How can they do that, sweetheart? They could be projects. They could be funding support that mm -hmm. could come your way. Where do we send them? Uh, well, I'm all over social. Uh, Bobby Singh Brown is my handle, um, whether it's Insta, Facebook. Um, I don't think I'm on x anymore um that's a good by, decision by the way mm -hmm. yeah healthy um bsbfilms.com is my website um uh, i promise to update it shortly and that's it man if you need to get a hold of me i'm not i'm not a hard guy to find i'm uh you know i like talking to people as you can tell absolutely thank you my darlings go support the film guys and i will see you next time on anoki and censored stay connected with us at anoki lifestyle on social media don't forget to sign up for our free weekly newsletter at anokilife.com and please support the things that we are doing we cannot grow and 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 you know shine a light on our community and the things that are important to us unless we come together this hour that we've spent together is a testament to that story. Please support each other. It's what we've been doing at Anoki for the last two decades, and we'll continue supporting you guys. Guys, I wish you the very best. I cannot wait to hear so much more. Hit us up when the soundtrack comes out. I cannot wait for that. This is Rajgan. You were listening and watching Anoki Uncensored. Come back next week. I can't wait for all the wonderful things that we're going to continue experiencing together and go support these two guys. They're worth it. Bye.